so gentrification in the CD is like, well, you know, I had to, I had to, I was lucky to get what might be called. I don't know if it's lucky, but I got a front row seat uh, to the transition from um, the, the central district, the central district's transition from a black neighborhood to a predominantly middle class or upper middle class white neighborhood, right? And it is. It was a transition of class as well as race. It wasn't just simply a transition of uh, a transition of uh, of color. You know, you have to specify like what kind of people actually moved there. I don't think a lot of poor whites moved or could afford to move into what is Central District now, right? So mostly professionals or those with money. And I had a I was uh, I I moved in that neighborhood in 1995, which is, I think when the transition was starting. Right, or at least you could say it was. In, it was. Uh, it had, I think it started probably in the late eighties, but it was clearly. Um, 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 it, you couldn't miss it by nineteen ninety five or six, and everybody sort of was talking about it at that time, and um, there was still a large. When I was there, there's still predominantly the large black neighborhood. I had black neighbors and this sort of thing, and in under a decade, they were gone. Most of them were gone, and. Um, um, there were, you know, in the transition, there's a lot of, uh, um, there's a lot of, I mean, by 2001, it was clear, it was over. Like, people still talk about the Central District as, as if it's gentrifying <laughs> now, but I, I think by 2007, it was, the process was over. Sanderson. I am the CEO of Bird Bar Place and we're a 54 year old agency that's been providing services to the low income community since 1964 and I have been here for 15 years but I've lived in Seattle for over 30 years. Now a lot of my friends that I went to church with, that I hung out with socially, lived in Seattle, their families lived in Seattle so that brought me to Seattle from Kent um, on a weekly basis. And so I have grown to know Seattle as a home because it was homes to my friends and their parents and grandparents. I um, came, frequented hair salons, um, barbershops with my brother here in, in specifically in the CD. And what I see now as I drive up 23rd Avenue, which is sort of the starkest difference in the changes in Seattle, is just a very different landscape. Um, I see a different type of person walking down the street. I see a different type of person eating in restaurants. Um, I understand there's an excitement about the prosperity in our region because of the technology industry. And a lot of people liken us to San Francisco. They'll say we're San Francisco 2.0. Mm -hmm. And while in some sense that might be great and we're in close proximity to innovation, what I'm also seeing in Seattle is that not everyone is being able to take it up, have opportunities in that prosperity. Not everyone is being given access to those opportunities. And so it's really heartbreaking because a lot of the people who aren't given access to those opportunities, they're coming through our doors for services. And it isn't because they don't want opportunity or they don't have a desire. It's that it is a very closed system. So what I see in Seattle is that today, for instance, between eight and five, you'll see a different type of person coming through our doors. You'll see people who are living in poverty many different colors and then you'll see after five people who are of a higher socioeconomic level are walking down the street they're playing in the park adjacent to our building with their children they're jogging they're walking their dogs and it's a very different view from what you see during the day that's happening eight to five and so i do see two seattles in the time that i'm here every day There was two things that were interesting to me when I observed the transition. One is when I first went there, there were just no businesses, 
right? So the, the whole neighborhood was sort of completely what you'd call underdeveloped, right? There was no investment going into the central district, right? It was, I, I, used to, I used to sort of joke that it was easier, you know, in certain parts to get your nails done than to buy a, 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 a jug of milk, right? Because there was these food deserts, right? And, um, and you know, pretty much the city had sort of abandoned it for all of that time, right? The city and the business community abandoned the central district, right? So it was underdeveloped in that sort of classic sort of third world or developmental language, right, in economics, right? And, um, and so the tra the, a big part of the transition was reinvestment, right? So money coming in. Now, everybody who sort of is, who sort of defends gentrification says that um, they've brought businesses in, they've, you know, they've, now people are working and the, the blight is over and so forth and so on. But it, it's that kind of language to me is really dangerous because um, it, it, it implies that the, the poverty was, was related to black people and not to, uh, and not to um, actual cultural and social constraints imposed on black people like redlining. But then supermarkets are opening, businesses, uh, uh, restaurants open and all these things that weren't there before. So, um, uh, yeah, but they're just following the money is what they're doing. They're not, it's not that the money has been generated, it's just that people with money moved into those neighborhoods. So my grandparents on my mother's side moved to Seattle from Beaumont, Texas in the uh, early 50s. And they basically created a life for their family. Um, I was the first grandchild, so um, that decision, in some ways the arc of that in relation to my existence um, was pretty profound because my grandparents was able to build a house in uh, the Central District. Um, they were able to raise a family. Um, you know, a, a lot of things in terms of preparing the way for, for me to be able to flourish happened in relation to that decision in, in that area. Um, so by virtue of my grandparents, I have a lot of uh, memories of, you know, going to certain businesses, getting my hair cut, places to eat, to shop, um, cultural events and all that that were associated with uh, the Central District. Now, that changed over time, like the Central District has changed, um, and maybe it became more of a negative. Um, I think as I got older and wasn't, uh, for one, not living there, um, I associated it as a place of a lot of trauma, especially for black people, uh, whether it was around um, police violence or even around natural disasters like earthquakes. You know, I remember one earthquake, I've, I've experienced at least two earthquakes, if not three in my lifetime here in Seattle, but one that had a detrimental impact on businesses in uh, specific areas in the Central District, whereby, and they didn't recover from it. Um, I also show it as a place of hypocrisy and a contradiction, especially uh, around let's say, uh, marijuana laws, um, in that you know now, especially with legalized marijuana, um, you know areas where you find businesses that are flourishing are the same areas where Black people were policed, and and they're still not benefiting from that, and there are still people who are in jail for the same thing for something that's still legal, um, and unfortunately we've been slow to realize that that like while it's great. I mean, I don't smoke, but while it's great that you can, there are people in prison for the same thing. Why are they? But we, the narrative around that and the responsibility for that hasn't changed. You know, it's a, it's a really, um, it's a really difficult situation because I think for the, they were upset because they just never received the chance or the opportunity to make the neighborhood work. You know, it's, a, it's a, it, everybody might call it resentment, but it's almost like they've been cheated twice, right? First time they were cheated by a lack of, of la a lack of opportunities um, in the neighborhood, and then they cheated a second time by losing a neighborhood, right? And so um, there 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 is a lot of anger about it, and so you have sort of strange like you know you know you have like I think like um, unexpected um, contradictions, right? So one contradiction is this: is that for example, um, and I sort of this was sort of uh, this was my my favorite sort of thing because um, the rest the, 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 if you looked at the kind of businesses that were in those neighborhoods they're often so f sort of fast food right at the most part right and so when, when the neighborhoods developed right 
um, they sell like um, um, healthier foods, right? Healthier restaurants and the grocery stores sell, you know, better products, right? With less chemicals in them or what I would like to say with less, less class struggle in them. I think that a restaurant like McDonald's, when you eat a hamburger, you're eating a lot of class struggle. <laughs> And that's why it's unhealthy for you. You want to eat the, the healthier something is, the less, the better the people are paid for making it. Means that there's, so there's less anger going into the few food. But um, in those days, so what the contradiction is, they end up uh, seeing all of these nice restaurants and, and things open up, and so they associate that with their, um, you know, with 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 their displacement. Right, and it's not fair that so some people will complain like, oh, we'll like look at even like Pizza Hut nostalgically because at least they were around when the neighborhood was there, right? Or if you get like an oven, you know, an oven, um, you know, speciality pizza place or something where that's it's, it is much healthier for you, right? That's associated with the people who are moving in and 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 taking over not only your homes but also your 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 businesses and so forth. So there's this there's, that's the contradiction, right? And so. Um, and but um, the, the the feeling is is one of defeat for a lot of people. It's just defeat. I mean, you didn't win, right? You didn't win. Uh, you didn't win during the uh, during the period when the suburbs are receiving all of that, uh, all of the all of the support from the government in terms of like infrastructure, roads, and things like that. And then they abandoned the inner city. And then you didn't win. <laughs> and finally, they were like investing in the inner city, right? And um, and suddenly construction started and jobs are popping up everywhere and you're forced to leave, you know, to live, to, to move to the, to move to uh, the, 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 the outside or the suburbs or, you know, just, you know, uh, distant parts of, of, of the city and to commute. I mean, it's just, it's completely like, you, yeah, you, the feeling is that we just can't win in general. It's been six months since I last stayed here Reminiscing on my past and times that I played here All the way up to the moment of the day I feared When I had to pack my bags and move away from here Coming back, these streets no longer feel familiar And it's at that second when reality hits you What I see and what I know are no longer the same picture Amazed at how fast my neighborhood has switched up Long gone Other days we rode bikes and ran the streets Wilding at the neighborhood block parties in the summer heat Faded memories of a place that lost its life In this space dance hollowed out buildings and street lights Watched the city resolve my hood and change its name forced to sell the land we own and couldn't maintain market value steady increasing and nowadays a thousand dollars a month don't even buy you halfway decent and really black who can afford that i'd rather pack up than live financially strapped working two jobs just to pay rent and food's not even an option and don't forget police is still watching black businesses that used to thrive now barely surviving why suburban you're moving in from out in the highlands into new settlements eminent domain is legalized embezzlement all in the name of community Redevelopment. The yes justifies the means. Make a handshake and seal a man's fate. My eyes have seen plans shape the scope of my hood's landscape. Twisted fate of people misplaced under the guise of real estate. Yeah, I know that there's a technical definition for gentrification, but what I see is that it's a turnover. Um, I, from my understanding, I'm not a historian. I know that most communities across the United States and even the world. They have experienced turnover, and so this turnover is natural. Um, the way in which it's happening in modern day society is, is so quickly, um, everything is so rapid, and while in one sense the turnover is creating opportunity for a lot of us, it's creating transgressions for a lot of other people. Um, I have friends who say, um, and these are white friends, who say, you know, Andrea, um, my families were the families, my grandparents and parents who committed the white flight outside of Seattle, outside of the CD. So the communities that lived adjacent to the CD, who left and went to the suburbs, they're telling me that now their kids and grandkids are the ones moving back and gentrifying the communities. And so that's not lost on them. Um, that now what they're yearning for, what they're interested in, and what they're moving towards acquiring is displacing others and taking away opportunities from others. 
And so I don't, I don't know how to define that, but I'm, I'm seeing it in my mind's eye and my image as a turnover. Mm -hmm. And a turnover that works for some and it's not working for others. So to me, gentrification is basically the concept of whoever has the most money wins. And it's happened throughout the history of unequal power, which is the history of the world, but it's really gotten much worse in the past 30 years since we've dismantled all the protections. We used to hold, you know, housing has dual purpose. It's both a home for people to live in, but it's also a financial investment, a financial tool for wealth accumulation and stability. And we used to hold those in balance in the way we developed housing policy and we don't anymore. Now it's 100% let the market decide. This is you know, a, tool for a tool for wealthy folks to store money. It is primarily an investment and secondarily a home for people to live in. And so to me, that shift that happened you know, in the 70s and 80s with deregulation of banking, with sort of let the market decide mentality pervading everything with the rise of sort of global wealth and the ability global wealth has to move around has really like exacerbated this condition. And the research has shown that this, what do you call it, this war on, on poverty, this war on poor people, right, um, has done a lot of damage in terms of like the kinds of ways that, that poor people can um, connect together to um, to make to make things work, uh, that's a big loss for a, a, a large number of people, and I think that that a, 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 a considerable part of homelessness stems from this, from this, um, from this uh, destruction of, of of poor communities, of the of their networks and their systems of support, and it's, it's understudied because everybody thinks poor people don't help each other. Everybody thinks poor people are like rich people, like they're just these, you know these different in individuals, right? But I know that if you look at it, if you do enough study, you'll find that the, the poorer you get, the more dependent you are on others, right? And then that support, right? We've demonized poor people. We see them as, you know, thieves. And so we don't see their their community as, um, their we don't see the structures. We don't, we don't examine how their, their, their communities really function, right? We just see reports of, robberies or whatever, you know what I mean, gang activity. We, that that they'll, they'll focus on, but they'll never look at how did the neighborhood, what did, what did a neighborhood like the Central District do for black people, even when it was neglected, even when it was poor, right? And I think that we, and so just displacement alone is not, people, people fall off during that move, right? And tons of people just fall. They just, you know, they, they end up, and usually they end up on the street, you know, because, uh, yeah, we we don't we don't we never we never we never really gave their communities um, or their, their their you know the structure of their communities real. Um, 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 we never we never saw it in a positive light, right? Poor people, we only give them you know the negative a negative outlook a negative picture. Police them more, do that more, right? And that sort of that's our dialogue, right? Broken windows. That's what we mean. In Seattle, you know. We, we have a history of redlining, we have a history of exclusion by race of you know, some neighborhoods, so black folks primarily were pushed into the CD and they created a great community there. They created a you know, thriving commercial district, community, a sense of cohesion, a sense of caring for one another. You know, and I'm glossing over a lot, clearly it wasn't, it's, but there were, there was a lot of positive to the community that was built because of redlining and because of the need for um, black people basically to stick together and protect one another. And when we got to this condition in our city of rapid growth, all of a sudden we just turned that condition upside down. So we have all these forces happening at the same time that are just putting so much pressure on the housing market and communities of color and lower income communities and creative communities that have typically been in the CD. And we're in this place now where it's just housing prices are skyrocketing. 
rents are skyrocketing. Um, the machine of real estate is just continuing to, you know, go wherever it wants in this city, and we have destroyed communities. We have forced people out of the place they built for themselves. We have created a condition where people who built a neighborhood, who grew up in a neighborhood, can't afford to stay there, and we've, you know, blown apart communities and forced people out to the suburbs with long commutes and lack of access to services. I mean, you know what it looks like, you see it. And I think it's appalling for for most folks, like they don't want that to be true, but the, the issues are so complex, it's hard to know where to start. It's hard to know how to fix it. Gentrification is the, sort of the, the physical uh, change and the economic forces that come along with it. Uh, the other big thing is sort of the cultural change. Um, you know, when there's new investment, it sort of changes the character and the nature of the, of the neighborhood. Um, you have to look at what are the types of shops that are going in, um, what are the, the goods and services that are being offered in that neighborhood, and who are they marketed to. Um, I think that's something that you can see probably the, the biggest change uh, in terms of the Central District. You know, if you go over to 23rd, 24th in Union, um, it's a lot of new, fancy um, burger shops, bicycle shops, pot shops um, that weren't there. Uh, and it's always good to call the question of why weren't those there in the first place and who are they really serving in the neighborhood? Well, of course, there's a push for market rate homes. Um, it is about the business bottom line for the city and the people who own property. And so naturally what people think of first is the highest and best use of funds and making the most amount of money. And in those conversations, we don't get to talk about, but then how do we create space for affordable housing? How do we accept less rent? How do we maybe not make as much on the sale of a house or a piece of property in service to a person who wouldn't be able to afford it to be able to be there? So what we see as a result of that is less affordable housing. There's a lot of work and a lot of policy around creating, force, creating affordable housing, creating force and functions to make affordable housing happen, but it's not nearly enough. So while I do applaud the city of Seattle and other institutions for understanding that it is an issue and that it is important and prioritizing it, enough isn't being done. Because the reality is it's about being able to get as much money as possible to facilitate what people need. And what people need may not be you know, creating affordable housing for people who are underrepresented, for voices who are least likely to be at the table to be able to be a part of those opportunities. So a little bit about uh, myself and Capoho Housing. Uh, in Capoho Housing is a 42-year-old uh, public development authority and community development corporation. Um, what that means is that we have a, a mission to uh, build community and also build and preserve affordable housing all throughout the city. Uh, we got our start in 1976 based in the Stevens neighborhood area of Capitol Hill, um, but from a very early time, we were working outside of, of the Capitol Hill neighborhood, down Belltown um, and out in the, the central area as well. How can we partner with the organizations that are in these neighborhoods, um, identify the needs that they have, the capacity that they don't have that we do, um, so we can work with them um, to address these issues, uh, affordability, gentrification, displacement. We're hoping to take what we learn uh, in the Central District and, and apply it in partnership with other neighborhoods and other communities. And we see it as a graduated approach. By approaching people who are neutral on the topic, it's easy to approach the person who's sort of on your team and they get it, they live those values and they just want to jump in and roll up their sleeves and help. But it's the people who were standing on the sidelines because we're not quite sure and we don't know. And so our tactic really is to provide information and then invite them in to take action. And then through watching that, we have, in the graduated approach, the people who are resistant are able to see that transformation, and maybe then they become neutralized. It doesn't happen overnight. I mean, we've been, been doing this work specifically around affordable housing for probably eight years, and we've neutralized a lot of people who have felt the rhetoric that we always hear, where poor people are poor because it's their fault, poor people are poor because they're lazy, because they suffer from addiction, I worked hard, they should work hard too. And we've seen shifts in that rhetoric among people who were resistant eight years ago. And so we see it as incrementalism. We can't just go out there on the bully pulpit with everyone who is not open to hearing that. 
personally what I've learned is that people feel attacked. When they feel attacked, they'll get defensive and shut down. And part of that defensiveness is, is, is being contrary, contrary to what is fact, right? And so what we see is, this is insane for them to think that poor people are lazy. It's a defense mechanism. So if you create space to really listen to what people have to say, and you hear about their hopes and dreams and visions, they actually quite align quite well with poor people, and we're able to open that space to create that alignment. But it's time consuming, and it takes layers and layers and layers of conversation, and layers and layers and layers of invitation. So they may not say yes immediately, but it's being aware to keeping a seat at the table for them when they're ready. And so bringing people back into that <clears throat> constructive mindset, wouldn't it feel great to solve this problem? How can we work together to solve this problem? Is the way that I've dealt with that. And, you know, and, and owning my own privilege. I mean, it, it helps other white folks feel like, yeah, maybe I could look at my success too. You know, that, and you know, there's a lot of solutions that have already been identified that I, some are in motion that I wanna applaud and support and help make happen. You know, this is one of the main issues to work on is how do we, how do we reclaim that power and that authority to, to shape the city in a way that works for all of us? And if I had one, you know, this would have been my first priority as mayor, that we have to stop pushing people out, we have to find aggressive solutions, we have to find adequate revenue to be building affordable housing. Like, you know, this, to me, this is one of the central issues of our time and central issues of our city. Community outreach and community engagement is something that you really can't overlook. I think it's really the difference between a development that happens to the community and development that happens with the community. Um, and it, it takes time, uh, it takes a lot of extra effort, it takes a little extra money, uh, but it, it's so, so worth it. Um, I think for us, uh, what we found to be really effective is um, finding some key partners um, who can form sort of an, an advisory committee or a guiding group um, that isn't necessarily making all the decisions, but can help us um, sort of come up with a appropriate outreach strategies uh, for getting large scale community involvement. You know, at Liberty Bank Building, we took that a little bit a step forward or further um, in that these are partners that we're hoping to share ownership with um, and we're making a lot of decisions jointly in that way. Um, but they're also the group that we rely on uh, when it comes to um, working with the community, um, calling community meetings, bringing people out. Uh, I think it's, it's one thing for us to call a community meeting um, and ask people for input on what they want to see in the neighborhood, but it's something else when it's the local community groups that are there uh, that are also uh, pulling for it. And also, frankly, you know, probably know that the community a lot better than we do um, and have the built-in trust already. I think that's something, uh, you know, talk about it as, as community engagement. Uh, you can also talk about it as like, trust building because um, that's, I think, a lot of the work that we do, particularly when it comes to development and change in the neighborhood. Even as an affordable housing developer, you know, we go with uh, the best intentions, um, but because of frankly, the history, <laughs> uh, even uh, that type of, of development can sometimes be viewed uh, with a little bit of, of distrust. So we're always mindful of that and trying to find ways to uh, show people that you know, we can work with them on this project and others like it. And I'll just say this is you know, things that we've heard as an affordable housing developer, uh, looking to partner with organizations in the Central District. Uh, a lot of what we've heard um, about community concerns, a lot of it is around uh, affordability and displacement. Um, it's probably very similar to concerns in, in other neighborhoods, um, but there's a, a sense and a feeling that people's backs are against the wall, um, that we see you know, development going up, uh, but it's not affordable for the folks who uh, have been living there uh, or people who might want to come back and live in the central district. Um, you know, we heard specific things around um, uh, commercial opportunities. You know, one of the things that's really defined the, the central district particularly as a, a hub for the black community was uh, local businesses and black owned businesses. Um, you know, it's one thing to be able to have a residence in the central district, but those, those third spaces like where the, the coffee shops, where the um, restaurants, where the, the bookstores that people can hang out and make it really feel like a community. Um, the same time that people are feeling residential uh, affordability concerns, it's also really hard for businesses and, and small businesses to hold on. Right, these are the real, 
these are the real consequences. I know housing is important, but I almost go back to, you know, we live in a system where wages, where your, and, and people don't see this as strange enough. I always have to go back to this. People don't see this as odd, but in order for me to live, I have to get a job. I know it's something that, you know, people say, of course you do. It's like, no, it's not actually, that's actually weird that I have to go and work at these businesses and so on and so on so that I don't die. <laughs> I don't, so that I don't starve to death, right? That's a, ultimately the stick that gets me to work is the fear of, uh, is the fear of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the effects of poverty, which is hunger lack of housing, right? These are dangerous situations to be in, right? These are not, you know what I mean? These are existential situations. You know what people say? So forget, like, no, actually not having a house is a crisis. It's an existential crisis. You know, finding it difficult to get decent food is an existential crisis. I could get sick. I could, you know what I mean? I could, I'm more exposed than I end up in the hospital. I got bills. No, no, these are, these are, you're putting my life at risk if I don't get enough money to live in this society, right? And so to me, the wage is, I always begin, the wage is so crucial, right? In, t- in helping homelessness, in helping uh, neighborhoods, uh, to helping people who are uh, 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 working at the school, right? The more you pay them, the stronger their families become. And the more secure they, and the, the better chances they have for, for improving the lives of their children and, and their future. I mean, you just can't do it living you know living on a on a, on a shoestring budget i mean in a, or living in a in a in a in a situation where you're rent burdened you know in certain these 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 things create the condition for crisis that can and often does harm to your life physical harm i mentioned that we've done two studies previously so we've done our um, quantitative study on the state of black washingtonians well, we are going back in to do the qualitative versions of each pillar that we've studied. Two years ago, we did the economic security pillar. Next is the health pillar. The health is next on the horizon for us because we've learned that one in five black Washingtonians will lose health care if Obamacare is repealed. We've also learned that um, the average um, lifespan for a Washingtonian is 80 years and a lifespan for a black Washingtonian at 76. And even 15 years leading up to our death, we lose our quality of life. And so we find that that is the issue to sound the alarm on. Affordable housing, of course, is equally as important. More can and, and should be done. Um, I have this idea, uh, and it's a little bit inspired by the great migration of uh, black folks from the South to the North this idea of there being a great migration back to the central area that is specifically focused on black people who have been displaced, who still live in the Pacific Northwest, and that under that moniker of the great migration, it is to say that there are some shifts and changes happening there, and even the expectations that, you know, there will be kind of um, space and exceptions unless they've been made so that black people can come back. And, and that it be unapologetic in relation to that in terms of going, well, why just black people? We're going, okay, once again, you're missing the point. Instead of us telling this narrative of how sad it is that at one time it was over 70% of the population in the central area, and now it's down to 12 or 7%, we're saying, let's get it back up to 70%. And so what needs to happen? And that if black people do well in terms of being able to come back, then that says something positive about our city. Everyone benefits, but if they can't, it's a problem, you know? And so I've just had this idea in the back of my mind right now, it's just a name of saying, I love the great migration back. And, and that, that a lot of different individuals, entities, organizations, what have you, could play a role in helping that manifest. And I think Seattle University could help that manifest as well. Things just ain't the same. 
It's been six months since I last stayed here. Reminiscing on my past and times that I played here. All the way up to the moment of the day I feared. When I had to pack my bags and move away from here. Coming back, these streets no longer feel familiar. And it's at that second when reality hits you. What I see and what I know are no longer the same picture. Amazed at how fast my neighborhood has switched up. Long gone. Other days we rode bikes and ran the streets. Wilding at the neighborhood block parties in the summer heat. Faded memories of a place that lost its life. In this space dance, hollowed out buildings and street lights. Watched the city rezone my hood and change its name. Forced to sell the land we own and couldn't maintain. Market value steady increasing. And nowadays, a thousand dollars a month don't even buy you halfway decent. And really black, who can afford that? I'd rather pack up than live financially strapped. Working two jobs just to pay rent and food's not even an option. And don't forget, police are still watching. Black businesses that used to thrive now barely surviving. Why suburban you're moving in from out in the highlands into new settlements? Eminent domain is legalized embezzlement, all in the name of community redevelopment. The ends justifies the means, make a handshake and seal a man's fate. My eyes have seen plans shape the scope of my hood's landscape. Twist the fate of people misplaced.